from the vault. High atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hola, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Talking Catholic. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. How are you, Mike? I am delightful. This is, uh, it, it is, we are recording this on October 1st, which is, uh, the, means the beginning of the true fall season for me. I am a fall human being. Um, so it means flannel shirts will be worn again and jeans and hats and sweaters. I, this, my body was not made for summer, so I'm very excited about fall coming. How about yourself? Yeah. I am excited. My birthday is in, uh, you know, this beautiful season in November. So, you know, I'm looking forward to it and, you know, just so excited to be here talking with you. Yeah, and this is going to be a nice one. You know, we've had to do a couple of Zoom calls uh, out of necessity because we can't be together. This time we're doing a Zoom call for absolutely normal reasons, which is uh, we have a guest on who lives quite a distance away from us. We were able to invite him uh, telephonically. Uh, So who is joining us this week? So um, we have the pleasure of having with us Dr. Hoffman Ospino, who is a native of of Colombia. uh, And, you know, he has, uh, you know, studied philosophy and also holds a master's degree in theology with a concentration in church history and a PhD in theology and education from Boston College. His research explores the dialogue between faith and culture and the impact of this interchange upon Catholic theological education, catechesis, and ministry. And he has also served as the principal investigator for several nationally recognized studies on how the Hispanic Catholic presence is transforming parishes, schools, and organizations today. He has authored several books and, you know, is usually a frequent speaker at national and international conventions. And we are thrilled to have him with us today. Welcome, Hoffman Ospino. Thank you very much, Mariana. I missed the doctor part. (laughs) (laughs) It's a pleasure to be with you and Michael. Thank you. And and just to add to the flavor, um, so Dr. Ospino, I was able to meet for the first time just a few years ago when he attended the Convocation of Catholic Leaders, the Joy of the Gospel in South Jersey, which was uh, led and put together and spearheaded by my my beloved frenemy, uh, Donna Otavia, the Brit, who, uh, who we've had on the podcast several times. But um, as we were putting together the convocation, we were putting together potential speakers. Um, she was quite firm in her decision to make sure that Dr. Ospina was a part of the convocation. Um, so I figured since uh, Donna and Dr. Hospino probably haven't had a chance to chat in the last two years, that maybe we should bring her back on the program and connect some of the things that have been going on in the diocese with what uh, Dr. Hospino talked about at the convocation. So Donna, welcome aboard. Thank you, friend of me. I am very appreciative <laughs> of the title exactly. now. <laughs> that seems to be fairly viral since you nicknamed me that it's a viral. while back. Yeah. It's viral. So Mike and I are friend of me. Dr. Aspino, it is so good to see you again, and I'm delighted to have been invited to this podcast. And I had shared earlier that actually when um, Mike had invited me to be part of this, I was literally reading your book at the moment that he texted me and asked me would I be a part of this. So I know you've written several books, so that for the listeners, it's the gospel, the gospel of joy in America. Uh, So, and it's really based on your... um, convocation, the National Convocation keynote. So uh, really wonderful to be here with you today. It's so great to be with you as well, Donna. And, and just sort of like we said the tone right too, like these uh, podcasts we are doing in, you know, the middle of, uh, you know, the beginning of October, like in the middle of Hispanic Heritage Month. So, um, you know, we, we would like to talk about the contributions that Latinos are bringing uh, to our church, to the United States, and, you know, uh, we have the expert on the field and our, our <laughs> Dr. Espino. <laughs> um, no tell, us a little, tell us a little bit about you and, uh, you know, what has led you to be, uh, you know, such a leader in our church and in the Latina community. Sure, Marianela. Well, I currently teach at Boston College. I'm an associate professor uh, of theology and uh, religious education, and I also serve as the director of my department, the Department of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry. Uh, how did I, did I become involved, you know, in this type of research on Latino Catholics and so on? 
uh, first of all, uh, I'm a pastoral theologian. I come through the ranks. You know, I began my, my work in, the, in commitment in the life of the church, working in parishes. You know, I, I worked in a parish, oversaw ministry in a trilingual community. From there, I moved on to working in the Archdiocese of Boston for a while. Then I moved on uh, to the academy, you know, which you know, it, it was a natural transition for me, given my passion for, um, for theology, for education, and at the same time, the, the desire to find better ways to serve the growing Latino community. The other part of it is it came by default. You know, once you are Latino, you know, they, they start asking you the questions like, how do, how do Latinos do things? What do, what do Latinos say about this? You know, what does it mean to be a Latino and so on? And it's something that, you know, you cannot escape. So I decided I'm gonna embrace it as much as I can, you know? <laughs> I wanna, so, and I said, if I'm gonna, if people are gonna ask me about Latinos and the Catholic Church, I'm gonna go out and do research, identify the questions that people are asking. So I began going through the country you know, visiting dioceses, speaking in different places and so on, and learning from the communities. And that's part of my methodology and, and the research that I do. I like to go into the grassroots, to listen to the people in parishes, in dioceses, in offices, in Catholic schools. What are their questions? You know, what are some of the struggles? What, are, what is it that people are seeing? And from there, you know, I like to take notes. I like the practice of journaling. So I came back to my office, into my library, into my books, and then began to see what resources are out there, you know, documenting the Latino Catholic experience and how Hispanic Catholics, who constitute about 45% of all Catholics in this country, and the numbers keep growing, uh, how are, are, are we transforming Catholicism in, uh, in this country? So I saw some major gaps in terms of research, in terms of the theology, in terms of the questions that need to be addressed. So I just you know, jumped into that world of research and have done studies on Catholic parishes, uh, have done studies on uh, Catholic parishes serving Hispanic Catholics, uh, a national study on Catholic schools serving Hispanic families. Right now I'm advancing a national study on how Latinos discern vocations to the priesthood, religious life, and the permanent diaconate. And there is an upcoming study also on how Latinos discern vocations and work in Catholic schools as faculty and administrators. So the idea is to map out, you know, the different areas in which Hispanic Catholics are present and see how we are transforming the different structures and life of Catholicism but at the same time, naming, you know, those uh, structures of resistance, because, I mean, nobody likes to change. No structure likes to change. No institution likes to change. And sometimes it's difficult for many, uh, for many communities to accept that we are changing and that we are becoming a more Hispanic or a Hispanicized uh, church. Wonderful. Um, so, so my question would be like, if you could give a specific examples of how, you know, we are transforming the church uh, for the positive in the U.S., what would those examples be? Wow. Well, let me begin with the most obvious one. Babies. Babies and babies. <laughs> Children. Ah, uh, that, that's just fascinating. Hispanic Catholics, uh, I mean, Hispanics in general, you know, are a very young population. I mean, if, uh, if the, the listeners could look at me, you would understand how young we are, you know? No, I'm kidding. But... Uh, <laughs> um, you look young. <laughs> the, the median age of Hispanics in the United States of America is 29, no? So more than half of Hispanics in this country are younger than 25. That gives you a sense of the energy and the potential of the Latino community uh, at this very moment, and particularly in the Catholic Church, you know, in which 60% uh, of Catholics under the age of 18 self-identify as, uh, as Hispanics. So right now we have a very young, thriving, energetic population with a lot of questions, a lot of uh, ideas and hopes, you know, almost breaking doors and windows, you know, inviting the rest of the structures of the church, schools, parishes, institutions to pay attention to them. At the same time, being so young, 
Latinos, you know, most young adult Catholics are Hispanic and are at that age in which we are having babies and we are raising the next generation of Roman Catholics, no? So in a sense, the biggest contribution is giving, you no, know, preparing that next generation of Roman Catholics. And just as a reference for the listeners, just keep in mind, you know, the median age of Latinos in this country is 29. The median age of white Euro American Catholics is 55. No, so just sheer demographics are transforming uh, the, the the Catholic Church by the presence of Latinos. No, the big question for the Catholic Church is: Are we paying enough attention to young Catholics? No, are we who are Hispanic? And are we embracing them? Are we forming them so they can stay in the church and build the church of the future? Two, uh, I'm going to mention two more contributions, and I will be shorter on this. Uh, the second contribution that I would say that Latinos bring to the Catholic Church in the United States is the richness of a uh, religion that scholars call lived religion. You know, others call it popular Catholicism. What is it? You know, it's basically... Uh, when we speak about Hispanics and Catholicism, you know, faith and culture, these two realities are not separated, you know? I mean, for most Hispanics in the United States, being Hispanic and Catholic go hand in hand. There is no such a, such a separation that sometimes we tend to see in the United States of America when we are Christian on Sunday and the rest of the week we can be anything else, you know? But in the Latino community, we breathe Catholicism in, ma in, in many ways, Christianity, through our language, the practices, our families, the way we see the world in a sacramental way and so on, you know? And this is not unique to, to Catholics. This is actually how Catholics in most of the world are, you know? It is a little bit, I have to say, if I were to offer a cultural critique of Catholicism in the United States, we have become too Americanized in the U.S. in which we tend to separate frequently faith and life, you know? And many Catholics do so. Many, I mean, the fact that only 20% of Catholics go to Mass on a regular basis tells you so, no? So Latinos are, you know, and actually I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, actually get Latinos off the hook on this one because Latinos are pretty much the same, you know, 20% of Latinos don't go to mass on a regular basis. But the advantage of, La of the Latino community is that this cultural Catholicism, you know, this uh, popular Catholicism, you know, somehow permeates every aspect uh, of life. And it is more prominent among immigrants than it is among the U.S. Uh, born Latino population. So, we need to keep that in mind. How do we cultivate that in the future generations? And the third um, contribution that I would say that Hispanics bring, Hispanics, Latinos, uh, bring to the Catholic Church in the United States of America is a reminder to the Catholic Church in this country that we are a poor church for the poor. And I'm echoing here Pope Francis's words, and I'm echoing the gospel, no? So most Hispanics in the United States of America struggle with major social issues, poverty. Two-thirds of Latinos are close, you know, live under the poverty level or very close to the poverty level. Low levels of education, you know, we got nine million of Hispanics who are undocumented, living in this country undocumented, and struggle mightily. There's a lot of uh, Hispanic uh, um, single mothers, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I know, half of gang members in the United States of America are Hispanic. And the majority of all of the above are Roman Catholic. So in a sense, you know, that it's an invitation to the Catholic Church to go and look at how we are serving those communities that are struggling so much. And I see some tensions there because when we look at the Euro-American Catholic population, uh, we see a Euro-American Catholic population that is very established, you know, is mostly middle upper class nationwide. Not all white Catholics are uh, middle class or upper class, but the majority are. And then it's sometimes, you know, one of the tensions that we see is that those who are in positions of leadership in dioceses, in universities, in organizations, are not paying enough attention to the questions that are coming 
from the grassroots, from that community that is largely Hispanic nationwide. Thank you, that was a great answer. I think, uh, Don, I would like uh, you to bring, uh, you know, the diocesan perspective in terms of like, you know, how do you see the, the, the Latino population de being developed here in the Diocese of Camden uh, in response to Dr. Huspino's, uh, you know, question? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question and I appreciate everything that you've just shared, uh, Doctor, around kind of the rising, um, population, the age of the Hispanic population in the United States. And I, uh, so I want to share that we just did our first virtual Bickham training, which is building intercultural competency training here in the diocese, um, just to kind of sort of dry run what's it like to do virtually. And it was a very interesting thing that came out of that, um, that I took away. And so where communities are mixed in parishes, you plan with, not for, right? So how do we help? Because we have over 20 of our parishes that are primarily Hispanic. But then we have Hispanic members of parishes that are primarily white throughout the diocese. So how is it, like, what have you observed or come across in all of your speaking and all of the studies that you've done and all of the work? What have you seen that has been most successful either in integration in those parishes because we would love to hear that here in the diocese because there's a lot of work that's being done but you have much more of a sort of a u.s perspective probably a global perspective on what works for to integrate parishes where it's you know multicultural uh, and also in order to support young hispanic families what do we really need to think about doing and then there's a third piece here and if i can only remember them after you answer each of them <laughs> So Mike and Mary Nell will have to help me. We often talk about the youth, right? We talk about young people and we often lament the fact that it's hard to hold on to our young people. We put them through catechesis, religious education, and they still leave us. You know, and a lot of parishes think, oh good, we have a youth minister. Okay, we're good. We have a youth minister. It actually takes the entire parish, right, to keep those young people. So if you could share with us some of the best practices you've seen in these like three kind of areas, I think that would benefit us greatly. Okay. Wow. That's a uh, talk. <laughs> <laughs> so we have about what, four hours more? more than <laughs> <laughs> That's why Mike is letting me know what time it is, you know, so I should shut up now. So I'm done. Those are my questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's take uh, each at a time, you know. Oh, what works uh, in terms of uh, integration and, uh, and ways of bringing communities that are culturally diverse, linguistically diverse, you know, together? Uh, what I have seen work in many places is, first of all, you need to understand your parish. There is no such a thing as one size fits all, okay? For instance, you know, to speak about integration in California or Texas is much, much different than speaking about integration of parishes in uh, Ohio or uh, Wisconsin or even Massachusetts, Vermont, and you know, New Hampshire. So it varies, you know, and even within a diocese like Camden, you know, there will be uh, parishes with large diverse of experiences, you know, some of them may be 10% Hispanic, others may be 50% Hispanic, others may be 80% Hispanic. So how do you approach diversity and integration would vary depending on the, on the parish. So first of all, understand your parish. You need to understand this, not one size fits all, no? Uh, the second piece that I, that, that I would say is once you, uh, know, you understand you know, how diverse your community, how, how diverse your community is. What I have seen work best in parishes is when pastoral leaders are interculturally competent, okay? Because most of us are interculturally incompetent, you know, and we have to own it. We have to understand mm -hmm. that, you know? Many of us think that adding a psalm or a song or a prayer in Spanish will make a mass bilingual. Many of us think that because we eat spring rolls, burgers, and uh, empanadas on a Sunday, after Sunday mass, then our parish is integrated. No, no, it's much bigger than that, you know? 
intercultural competencies, you know, requires an entire process of conversion. And it requires an understanding that uh, we as a church, you know, that, that we as a church have different experiences that, I mean, it's almost, you know, there's a philosopher from Canada, philosopher Charles Taylor, who says, you know, that as a matter of fact, in diverse communities, in diverse cultures, what we experience is a plurality of Catholicisms. You know, we all believe in the same Jesus. We all believe in the same uh, sacraments. We believe in the same, uh, you know, we, we adhere you know, uh, to the Pope and the teachings of the church and so on. We believe in the Eucharist. Yet, how we live Catholicism in the particular you know, dimensions of our lives then that's a different ball game because one thing is black Catholics you know, forming community. Another one is to have a group of Vietnamese Catholics forming Catholic communities or white your American Catholic communities. Or, I mean, if, and, and here I'm just looking at the ethnicity and race, but look, for instance, you know, one thing is to form a parish in a poor neighborhood, urban neighborhood. Another one is to, form a Catholic community in an affluent, you no know, suburban neighborhood. So we need to, what we need to do is make sure that our leaders understand the nuances of what it means to live in a culturally diverse church. And that doesn't happen overnight, you know. We need to get off the high horse that with one workshop or that learning three words in Spanish or three words in Portuguese, then we become bilingual or we become culturally, interculturally competent. As a matter of fact, we become interculturally competent after a lifetime, throughout a lifetime. This is, this is not something that happens overnight. So, which leads me to the next point, which is patience, patience. We need to have patience and understand that building church is the work of the Holy Spirit is not the work of Hosman Ospin or Donna or Taviano or Marinela Nunez or anybody or no or anyone else. No, we are instruments of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit works at the Spirit's own own pace. You know, so that means that these interculturally competent ministers, no, for instance, need, no, need to set in motion dynamics that would allow people to be church. I'll give you a couple of examples, you know. I see far too many pastors, you know, and far too many lay ecclesial ministers who are obsessed with the idea that if you offer mass in Spanish, then your parish is gonna be divided. My dear friends, your parish is already divided, you know, because of the language, because of the nature of what, of what it is. It is what it is in that, in that, particu in, in that particular sense. So, but our mission, as, as a church, is not try to create homogeneity in that sense. Our primary mission is to ensure that women and men who have been baptized, who are disciples of Jesus Christ, have a regular encounter with the Lord that leads them to holiness and salvation. That's the basics. That's Catholicism Evangelization 101. So, then when, 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 when we shift our gears, thinking that way, the next question is, how do we do it? Well, for some people, it's going to be masses in Spanish. For other people, it's going to be life teen ministry. For other people, it's going to be immigrant uh, ministry. For other, other people, it's going to be Catholic schools. So it depends. You know, sometimes it's going to be English in Spanish. For, for other people, it's going to be Spanglish. And I don't know if you remember it. I think I've shared this with you before, but, you know, Spanglish is the fastest linguistic phenomenon in the United States of America. So everybody brace for your Spanglish every now and then, no? But I just want to, what I want to say is we need to be careful not to limit our evangelizing efforts to the idea of one size fits all or everybody needs to do things this way or this other way. So just to summarize, you know, just to summarize, we need, um, we need to understand that we need leaders. We need leaders that are interculturally competent. Good leaders make community, communities thrive. 
good pastoral leaders. That's why we need to form our priests well in seminaries, our future priests. That's why we need excellent lay formation programs, no? That deal with these matters. So we need good leaders, we need intercultural competencies, we need patience, we need patience, and we need adaptability, no? Those are some of the general ideas. Uh, young Hispanics, oh my goodness, this is a, a very uh, complex reality. When we say young Hispanics, we're talking about two thirds of the Latino population, you know? That's just, I mean, so, and there are 60 million people in the United States of America who self identify as Hispanic Latino, no? Uh, of those 60 million, 35 million self identified as Roman Catholic. If you were to pull together those 35 million Roman Catholics who are Hispanic in one place, in one little corner, we would be larger than most countries in Latin America. Just imagine that, you know? So trying to imagine, you know, how, how to serve this community, this large community in which the majority of people are children, youth, and young adults, you know? That's a major challenge. But we gotta start somewhere. We gotta start somewhere. The first thing that we need to say about young Hispanics is that most young Catholics, as a matter of fact, who are Hispanic, are U.S. born, okay? And that's very important. Just to give you a stat that always you know, baffles me, and that is 94% of Hispanics under the age of 18 are U.S. born, okay? So literally, when somebody com comes and you know, when somebody tells me I cannot do youth ministry, because uh, I don't speak Spanish. I said, don't worry about it. I mean, these young people are English speaking. They were born in the United States of America. You don't have to worry about this, you know? It's, it's there. So the biggest challenge in working with Hispanic youth is not language. The biggest challenge is inclusion. The biggest challenge is we need to pay attention to the needs, questions, and challenges that the Latino the young Latino community has. And that's where we are failing as churches. A few years ago, I did a study on Catholic parishes with Hispanic ministry. Only 40% of those parishes had a youth ministry program for Latinos. And these are the parishes serving Hispanic Catholics, no? So we are not, we're not connecting with the Latino community in our structures. Catholic schools, you know, still to this day, only, I mean, barely 4%, no? 4% of all Hispanic Catholics who are school age are enrolled in Catholic schools, okay? And uh, I mean, it, it, this, is, this is a major, major dyna dy dynamic. Young adult programs at the diocesan level are not serving by and large the Latino young adult Catholic population, okay? So what we need to do is literally go to the drawing board, drawing board in terms of pastoral planning, and then do a good census of our diocese, good, do a good analysis of who our Catholics are, and we need to start shifting you know, the hiring and the programming in our dioceses and parishes and Catholic schools, and then begin to say, what kind of programs what kind of leaders do we need to serve in a church that is largely bilingual and increasingly Hispanic? Now, as I said, you know, it, th I'm not saying that only people who speak Spanish can work in dioceses or, or parishes, but it would be helpful. It would be very helpful. But more than language, what we need to work with Latinos and young Latinos, you know, the question is culture, cultural sensitivity. And I will give you one example. I have visited parishes around the country that have exciting life teen ministries. Beautiful life teen ministries, you know, vibrant, great music, great field trips, you no know, great uh, moments of prayer and so on. And in most of those life teen ministry uh, groups and, and communities, Hispanics are absent. And the one reason, I always ask why, you know, why? And people ask me why. And the main reason is for some, for some particular uh, uh, circumstance, you know, uh, culturally, the life teen model doesn't connect with the Latino community. 
and it's not the language because most of the young Hispanics are, are, are English speaking. So it's, the, the question is how do we create models of youth ministry that take into consideration language, culture, religious tradition, and especially, you know, many young Hispanics would rather go to mass and would rather worship in contexts where their parents, immigrant parents are around, you know? That's another piece that we need to keep in, uh, that we need to keep in mind. And I mean, I could give you way more, you know, and expand, but I, I'm mindful of, uh, of the time. And I still have the third question, you know, which, uh, oh, <laughs> holding on to, how do, how do we keep young Latinos uh, in the Catholic church, you know? And what I'm gonna say is actually applies to all groups. You know, almost every group in the United States of America, uh, in the, uh, uh, every ethnic cultural group, racial group in the Catholic church is struggling with you know, seeing an exodus of young, young Catholics leaving the church. People are, self, you know, are, are kind of checking out of, uh, uh, of, the, of their Catholic identity for many reasons, you no? Know? But let, let me stick to the Hispanic community. It is estimated that about a full quarter of Latinos in the United States of America uh, are former Catholics. That's about 15 million people. Most of them stopped self-identifying as Roman Catholic before or around the age of 24, okay? So very young age, you know, very young age. At the age of 24, that was my prime. That's when I actually wanted to be the super Catholic. You know, I wanted to do mission work. I wanted to serve in my community. I wanted to do catechesis, you know. I wanted to serve my community. Many young Hispanics, it, you know, it is precisely at that age when they are just checking out, you know. And there have been you no know, follow-up surveys with the so-called non-religiously affiliated who were Roman Catholics and so on. And it's fascinating to see in the Latino community, no? When you interview or survey former Catholics who are white, you're American, many of them tend to cite disagreements with teachings of the church, disagreements with a bishop, disagreements with a pastor, disagreements with the color of this, the, the walls of the church. I mean, just disagreement with something, you know? It is a, it is, it's a good way of saying, I disagree with that. And that reflects you know, the cultural mindset of your American Catholicism or, or, or many of your Americans. You know, I, as, as an individual, choose to leave because I, I, it doesn't connect with me. I don't fit you know, here or there. But when you ask the same question to the Latino community, I was surprised and actually, well, not, not a surprise, but I was, uh, I, I was touched by, by the answer. And the answer for most Hispanics was, nobody pay attention to me. I wanted to be community. I wanted to be church. I wanted to be in the church where my parents go, where my abuela, my grandmother goes. And they didn't pay attention to me. I was not important to the leaders, to the catechists, to the priests, to whoever was in charge. I was not important enough. And I drifted away. I drifted away. And that, I would say, you know, in response to your question, Donna, what can we do to retain young Hispanics who are Roman Catholic in our church? Create spaces, create communities where we affirm them, where we honor them for who they are. We need to create spaces where Latinos, young Latinos, f find a safe community, you know, I mean, many of our, our young Latinos are struggling with drugs, violence, gang activity, poverty, and the church becomes a, a space, as a matter of fact, where they, you know, they should find that safe environment, you know? And they should find a space where they find family, where they find Jesus Christ, where they find, they, they find hope. I have to bear the bad news and report that most of our Catholic churches in the United States of America are not doing that. So we need to convert. We need to convert. We need to change structures and, you know, create those things. And, and you know, just following up on that question, uh, I would like to ask you, what is 
uh, you know, the Latino's responsibility, what is our responsibility to make sure that these changes happen and not just, you know, leave it um, to the Euro church? Like, you know, what is, what is, what do we need to be doing? Thank you. Thank you for asking that question because that is, a, that, that, that's the question that always gets left out, you know? So thank yes. you. Absolutely. What do we need to do? I mean, Latinos, two things, you know, on the one hand, Latinos need to own our faith and we need to work on becoming better catechized. We need to become, you know, we need to form the next generation. Latinos need to assume the responsibility. Gone are the days, in the 1960s, 7% of all Catholics were Hispanic, okay? Today, almost half of the church is, no, is Hispanic in this country. And I bet that in your diocese, it's a little bit more than that, if I'm not mistaken. So what we have, uh, what, what we have here is we can, the Latino community cannot simply cross our arms, you know, and wait for somebody to come and do things for us. We need to take leadership. How do we do this? First of all, send your kids to catechesis, please. We have to send, the, the Hispanics have to send children to religious education and form them in the faith. Or oh, Catholic I, schools. Catholic <laughs> schools, absolutely. We only have 10% 10, 10 of Hispanic children who are school age are being catechized in churches, in parishes, or in Catholic schools. Only 10%. 90% of them, I don't know where they are but it's very likely that they are not being catechized in their homes because their parents either are working or are, are not fully catechized either. So the Latino community needs to get its act together. We need to educate our children, and that's very important. Only 16% of uh, Hispanic adults has a college degree in this country, 16%, compared to 55% of white Euro-American Catholics no, who are adults. Have, and have college degree. So what we need to do is make sure that Hispanic children finish high school. And if we can afford it, and if we can do it, send them to a Catholic school, absolutely. But make sure that they finish Catholic school, that they finish high school, sorry, and that they go to college. Why this insistence on college? And I have, you know, I, I sound like a broken record on this when I give my talks. And the reason <laughs> is, Without a college education, the Latino community will not have priests, will not have Catholic lawyers, will not have Catholic uh, professionals, will not have Catholic doctors, will not have Catholic politicians, and so on. You know, it's very rare the seminary that would accept anyone without at least a college degree, without at least a college degree. But Latinos are lagging behind that, you know? And we need our women as well, our Latinas, to be highly educated and, and, and in positions, and, and in positions to, uh, of leadership. So that's the first thing, you know? We need to somehow assume responsibility of, the, of evangelizing, of evangelizing um, uh, the, the, our children, uh, our young communities, and sustaining uh, our ministries, no? The second thing that I, uh, that, that I would say that the Latino community needs to have is get more involved. You know? We need to get more involved in politics, ecclesial politics, neighborhood politics, national politics. And that means, you know, expressing our public voice about matters, you know. Latinos need to be, be involved in, for instance, when a parish is gonna close, you know, I this is this, this has happened all throughout the Midwest, the Northeast. I have seen it all throughout the country. When a parish is gonna close, and the parish has a Hispanic community, the last group consulted in that process is the Latino community, and Latinos are not getting involved in the in the politics. And I'm not saying here politics about being a Republican or a Democrat. That's that's not the politics I'm talking about. Although we should also get involved in that kind of politics, no. But we need to get involved in the politics of forming institutions, forming neighborhoods, forming a nation. Because let's be honest, this is our country and this is our church. And we are the church in the United States. Marinella, sort of turning this around on you, making you go from host to, to guest. 
you know, as a young Latino woman yourself, you know, with, with Dr. Espino has been talking about it. Maybe you, is this something you've felt in the parishes in your, in your time in South Jersey? What was, what was the question, Mike? Dr. Espino has been talking about, you know, you're, you're someone who has been in and around a lot of the parishes of South Jersey. And I'm curious if these things that you've sort of felt or you've heard about in, in your conversations with people. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when, when Dr. Ospina was talking about uh, people maybe leaving because they didn't feel involved, I think that's one of the things that really uh, touches Latinos. Uh, we want to feel that we are being used for something, that we are, uh, you know, able to help our church in some ways. And, you know, it's, it's you know, people that stay are, are active members of the church. They want, they are lectors, they are in choirs, they are in different groups that the church have. And, uh, you know, some of the thriving parishes that we have in the Diocese of Candem have that. And I think that's what people say. And actually, uh, some people uh, travel to those parishes, like, you know, 45 minutes, close to an hour, just to go and have that feeling of that church that is welcoming and that is, you know, making them feel like, you know, they have a place and that, you know, we can participate and help. And so, it's kind of like very interesting and, and important for our pastors to hear this because who doesn't need help? Who doesn't need, uh, uh, you know, somebody who can come and, and do something for the church? Uh, I believe, you know, that's the need. And that's what Latinos want, especially young Catholics. Like, you know, they want to do something. That's that as a perfect bridge to bringing Donna back in. So Donna's work with both the convocation as well as her role as a director of discipleship and leadership for the Diocese of Camden. Um, you're someone who's working with every parish and every pastor in the diocese for just this purpose. I mean, the entirety of the convocation was figuring out how to better utilize lay people in these parishes and getting these parishes to, to interact with their lay people in more effective ways. So, you know, Donna, maybe my question to you is, was the convocation successful in putting that seed in people's minds? And in the, what, two years since we've had the convoca convocation, have you seen successes that, that sort of Dr. Espino is hoping to see in our parishes? Mm -hmm. So what I would speak to is, um, so it's been a year and a half since the convocation. So we're not two years out, Mike. We're, <laughs> we're 19 months out. <laughs> it's close and, enough. <laughs> yeah, close, I know it's close enough, but uh, I think my observation, right? So people left the convocation really on fire with the Holy Spirit, really committed to how our church could be, you know, the mission hospital that Pope Francis calls for, reaching to the margins, inclusion of everyone, taking care of people, right? Being the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, and I think we saw some really nice things in parishes, because sometimes when you talk to a primarily Anglo parish leadership team, you know, when you talk about these kinds of things, well, we don't really have a lot of Hispanics. You know, when you give them the population, though, that's around their parish, sometimes they're surprised that there are that many Hispanic families in their parish boundary. So what are you going to do for them and with them, right, to include them and bring them in? One of our parishes, uh, St. Damien's in Ocean City, actually primarily uh, an older Anglo uh, parish, but with a sizable Hispanic community, they they intentionally brought Hispanic young men with them, like in their 20s and 30s, made those men part of their delegation as they came to the convocation. And they really did a lot of work to integrate their community in terms of worship and music and liturgy and um, even in the ministries, is to really bring people together. They've done some really beautiful work. Uh, but I also think there's a great opportunity in other parishes to think about what do we do from a leadership standpoint with our Hispanic members? So it's already come up in this conversation is, you know, Dr. Espino, you mentioned that, you know, often when we're talking parish closure, the Hispanic community is, is asked last. So what do we do? Where's the personal invitation to the members of our Hispanic community within our parish to join leadership? you know, to be invited in, because a lot of what I've come across is that, you know, well, they don't come, they're not part of, well, have you invited them? You know, it's kind of like the fallen away Catholics. It's like, have you invited them to return? The statistics are high 
on those fallen away Catholics who will say they've never been invited to return. So how do we create this sense of inclusion? How do we create these spaces that will be so necessary, right, for young Catholics that this is their place? And I think leadership is a great place for them, for parish leadership teams to think about, for pastors to think about. I know, I know pastors are busy. However, if we care about the thriving future of the church, there's that whole uh, concept of co-responsibility. Clergy, laity together are responsible for the active life of the church. And if Hispanics are making up, you know, what did you say, Dr. 45% of the church? About 40%. We have work to do, work to do. Yeah, and I would add to that, Donna, like, you know, how do we invite? And I think uh, if uh, you tell me about as a Latina, when you find that the priest actually comes and greets you and says, we would love to have you in such and such area of the church doing this kind of work, it's hard for a Latino person to say no to a priest, mm -hmm. especially to your pastor. So um, I would say that's, you know, one of the ways that the invitation could be really effective. What do you say about that, Dr. Ospino? I actually, what I wanted to say, building upon what you, Donna and you just said, Marianela, uh, is the Latino community, whether immigrant or U.S. born, is a profoundly organic communal uh, body, no? And uh, something that I have seen in many schools, particularly, but also in parishes, is that we tend to separate the children from the parents. You know, we tend to say, I'm going to focus on catechesis for children, or we want to uh, educate the children in Catholic schools, but we pay little attention to the parents or to, or, or, or to the older family. You know? Sometimes we focus on the U.S. born and forget the immigrant, or the other way around. We focus on the immigrant and forget the U.S. born Latinos. I think that if we are able to heal that div those divides, and I can guarantee you, if you, if you invite the, the children and the youth, you know, and then extend the invitation at the same time to the parents, you will have the entire family in your parish and they will get involved. And the other way around, invite those adults who, you know, are already, already being part of the community and want to serve, and they will bring their children, you know, and they will, they will become the next generation of leaders. But we need to start working as, you know, with Latinos as a family as much as possible. And you mentioned Catholic schools, um, you know, could you give us, you know, some advice to those maybe principals and school people out there who are listening to this podcast on, you know, what is, what is your, your dream for Catholic schools in the United States about Latinos being part of, of our schools? Um, I, <laughs> what's my dream? I got a lot of dreams, Marianela. Uh, <laughs> I, me gonna, too. You, you asked me one, but I'm gonna name two, yes. Uh, the first dream is um, many Catholic schools, many principals, uh, many Catholic school uh, leaders uh, focus excessively on enrollment, you know? And the question is, well, we gotta have five kids and 10 kids and 20 families and 30 families and then check the box, you know? And it's like a game, you know, uh, it's like a thermometer. I think that that's important. We need to get more and more Latinos, you know, but I understand that sometimes it's not possible. But the key is creating an environment in the schools where the Latino children and their families feel affirmed and welcomed, you know. And the more, and actually in the United States, based on the studies that I have done, in the United States of America, Catholic schools that have a friendly, welcoming environment for Hispanic families tend to attract more Hispanic families and children, and not only attract them, retain them. So environment is important. School culture is very important. The second advice uh, that I, or the second dream is more Hispanic teachers, more Hispanic principals more Hispanic administrators, you know? It's very important. In the field of public school education, we understand that the schools that serve minoritized groups better are those schools where a black children see black teachers, where a Hispanic children sees black uh, 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 Hispanic teachers, where young girls see women teaching, young boys see men teaching. Role models is, are very important, yet, the majority of Catholic school teachers in the United States of America, Hispanic no, uh, Catholic school teachers and administrators are sitting in the classrooms right now. You see, 
we need to form them. We need to form them and, and make sure that this, you know, the more kids we have in Hispanic children we have in, in Catholic schools today, that's gonna guarantee a larger number of teachers and principals in Catholic schools who are Hispanic later on. Later on. Like what would you tell to parents, like young, the young parents out there that are Catholic, that are Latinos, about the importance of sending their children to, to Catholic schools? Oh, well, I mean, first of all, uh, Catholic schools in the United States of America were established with two main goals you know, in mind. One, to provide the best possible education. And still to this day, Catholic, uh, Catholic schools uh, provide the best education possible. For the, for the Catholic community and for many, and for many others. 71% of Hispanic children in this country go to underperforming public schools. That means that those kids will not thrive academically. Most likely they will never graduate. Most of them will never graduate from college. No, Catholic schools guarantee that your child is gonna receive the best education and yes, they are gonna go to college. So, I mean, that, the bargain is there, you know? We're talking about the future of your children and the future of your entire family just by making the sacrifice and, you know, financial time and so on. So your children receive the best possible education. The other reason for which Catholic schools were created and or established in this, school as an ed, in this country as a network uh, is keeping the faith of the community. No, keeping the Catholic identity. And Catholic schools continue to do such work, you know, some better than others. But we need to continue, you know, if we want our children to have a solid Catholic faith, a good Catholic grounding, you know, not just making the sign of the cross or saying the Our Father and the Hail Mary, but learning history, learning civics, learning geography, learning, you know, learn, learning uh, art through a Catholic lens, send your child, you know, your children uh, to Catholic school. That's the best, uh, honestly, the, the best bargain that I, you know, th that we have. And I, I, I wish that we had more Catholic schools, as a matter of fact, you know. I mean, Hispanics didn't have much luck in, in, in that regard. Right at the time when, you know, the majority of school-age Catholic children become Hispanic, you know, we closed half of Catholic schools in this country. But still, that those that, that remain, you know, can do a much better job, you know, and welcoming these communities and parents should actually, Hispanic pa parents should look at those families you know, uh, or at those schools as a real option for their children. Marianela, you work with these families. Many Hispanic families don't know much about the values of Catholic schools because all they think about is it's too expensive. No, that's too much for me. And if you are able to bypass that block, you know, that wall about finances, and there are plenty of resources about it, I can guarantee you that many Hispanic families will decide to send their kids to Catholic schools. Thank you. Donna, do you have a special question for Ospino? Well, what, what I would, uh, I would love if you would comment on, because we, you know, Mike is letting me know how much time I have, so I should talk less. Um, I actually quote you quite a bit. So when you came to speak at the convocation, you told us that we were standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Those who went before us to build the church. So really, that's really what we think about ourselves. And the hard part is not to weary. If we are currently building the church of 100 years from now, not too weary. So is there anything that you would share with us around thinking about what it is that we're doing so that we stay the course? Because there are so many that are committed, you know, to an active thriving Catholic church. Absolutely. Well, I, I you know, Donna, uh, the Hispanic community needs to inform, uh, we need to learn more about, uh, about the work that your American Catholics have done, building churches and schools and universities, hospitals, and so on. And because it is on, on those shoulders where we stand, you know, in, in, in many ways. And then it is time for the, your American Catholic community, you know, to start passing on the baton to the Latino community and to the other ethnic groups, racial groups that are coming to enrich the life of the church, Asians, Africans, African-Americans, you know, uh, Native Americans and many others, you know? And then uh, pass on the baton so this community can also leave their imprint you know, in, the, in Catholic life 
and from there, you know, pass the church on to whoever is next, you know, 50, 60, 80 years from now. Thank you. Joining us today, Marinella and Donna, thank you very much for being a part of the podcast. Uh, we're going to wrap up now, but uh, listeners, uh, we'll chat with you again next week. Thank you very much.